Hello and welcome to the HistoryNetwork.org podcast. Just before we kick off with the last episode of Season 24, it's worth mentioning that Season 25, coming in the second half of this year, may well be the last season I narrate for quite some time. I've not fully decided things yet, but family life is changing and things are happening for me which mean that I may at least for some fair while be going from the narrating microphone. Now, of course, if I get inundated with literally one email of protest at this prospect, I might be swayed. But do bear in mind that if you've listened to our invitations previously for you, our listeners, to write a script on a subject that interests you and have the self-satisfaction of hearing that aired on our History Network podcast, then season 25 may well be the last time it'll happen with my voice, which may indeed be a deciding factor for you to rapidly put fingers to keyboard, or indeed to hold off until I've gone. Anyway, have a think, and please do let us know your thoughts. So without further ado, the historynetwork.org podcast, season 24, Episode 10, The Battle for Dorking and Spy Fever The battle at Dorking that never happened, and German spies that never existed, were a cause of great anguish to the British in the early part of the 20th century. The result would be the creation of a secret service, the rounding up of foreign nationals, and an explosion in the popularity of the spy genre, which would manifest itself with classics, such as John Buchan's The Thirty-Nine Steps. George Chesney had been an officer in the Indian Army, serving in the Bengal Engineers. He had seen action during the Indian Mutiny, being wounded at the Battle of Badli Ki Sarai. He knew what war could be like first-hand. In 1871 he anonymously penned the novella The Battle of Dorking, reminiscences of a volunteer. Written as first-hand accounts fifty years after the event, it recounts an invasion of Britain. Britain is prosperous, a big workshop, but blinded. Whilst she may have been the lead trading nation, others in Europe had picked up the mantle of militarism, priding themselves in their armies. Whereas in Britain the army had been run down with many units serving abroad. On the eve of war the government is forced to create conscript units. Even this proves problematic, with unions arguing their members should be exempt. When the invasion comes with an attack on Harwich, the Royal Navy is kept at bay by new weapons. The conscripts, untested and poorly led, prove inadequate for home defence and soon are on the run the culmination of which is a battle outside Dorking, Surrey, where the British are defeated. While we stood on this knoll, the endless tramp of men and rumbling of carts along the downs beside us told their own tale. The whole army was falling back. At last we could discern the adjutant riding up to us out of the dark. The army was to retreat and take up a position on Epsom Downs. The story was serialised in Blackwood's magazine in 1871. The date is significant. The Franco-Prussian War had come to its conclusion in January of that year. Ostensibly, France, Europe's leading military power, had been overrun by the Prussians in a couple of months, with only Paris holding out. Chesney's Battle of Dorking served two agendas. Firstly, it's a work of fiction drawing upon current affairs to add drama to the story. But, more subtly, Chesney is drawing attention to the affairs in Europe. He is highlighting the threat of the new German Empire and the fact that Britain did not have an army fit for commitment to any European conflict. The story proved to be a huge success, selling more than 80,000 copies within a month, and was later translated into French, German, Dutch and Italian. Its popularity created public interest in defence and foreign policy. There was an increased feeling in Victorian Britain that her hegemony was coming under threat, 
as the American and German industries started to make inroads into British markets, and at the turn of the century Germany entered into a naval arms race to challenge the Royal Navy's dominance of the sea. With these perceived real-life threats to Britain at the end of the 19th century, the invasion story became a piece of popular pulp fiction. In 1897, William Lecue's The Great War in England, 1897, introduced a new element which would become essential to the genre, the spy. Lecue was an astute judge of public taste. His spy fiction was set in the background of the world around him, so increasingly the enemy was Germany. In his world the villains were foreign waiters and men in false beards. His invasion of 1910 sold over a million copies and was translated into twenty languages. Fictitious first-person accounts proved powerful to the national psyche as the lines between the real news became blurred with spy fiction. The popular patriotic press, such as the Daily Mail, keen to sell papers, ran stories which seemed to add validity to the authenticity of the spy novels. In 1900 the Daily Mail reported that the invasion of England is one of the stock military topics in Germany and went on to explain spies had mapped the country. The more sober London-based Quarterly Review reported in 1908, There are in this country some 50,000 German waiters. The nakedness of our land is spied out. The blow will fall where we least expect it. Military men were produced as experts and widely quoted in the press. A Captain Daniel Driscoll claimed that there were in the region of 350,000 German spies operating in Britain. Not only was this figure twice the number of German nationals living in the UK, but it would have meant that half the German army would have had to be operating surreptitiously there. In 1905 the Committee of Imperial Defence issued a memorandum on foreign espionage at naval ports. The perceived threat was becoming self-fulfilling, to the point that in the opening months of the First World War questions were raised in the House of Lords about the growing feeling of irritation against Germans in port areas who could be spies. Lord Beresford felt the government was being too lenient, and if they did not act, local communities would take matters into their own hands. The curious thing about Britain's reaction to the threat of what was believed to be German spies was that there was essentially no threat at the time. The German Army Intelligence Service, the Geheimer Nachrichtendienst, was focused on France and Russia. This was the dominant German espionage service, yet it had a pre-war budget of just £15,000 to cover all its expenses. To put that into some perspective, a car at the time might cost around £500. Playing second fiddle to the army was the German Naval Intelligence Service, which had a much greater interest in Britain, yet its budget was even less than the army's. Run by a former employee of the Pinkerton Detective Agency, Gustav Steinhauer, he developed a series of casual relationships with German nationals living near ports within the UK, but this was hardly the network of efficient spies that Buchan's Richard Hannay would face. Max Schultz openly asked for naval secrets and flew a German flag from his houseboat. Siegfried Helm drew the fort defences of Portsmouth, then displayed them to a lady friend who reported him, and with the outbreak of war in 1914, Karl Henschel was forced to surrender himself twice to the police when he was initially turned away by the desk sergeant, who refused to believe he was a spy. Whilst it's easy to laugh at the escapades of the German spies, at the time the threat was taken seriously. In 1907, Lieutenant Colonel James Edmonds became the head of Britain's Directorate of Operations, it was Department 5 that would be responsible for monitoring espionage, MO5. Edmonds had been brought up in France and had witnessed the Franco-Prussian War first-hand as a child. He passed the staff course as top of his class 
a gifted linguist, he seemed a natural for the job. But he also came with preconceptions of a German threat, one he must uncover. He noted in his diary, the Germans make little secret of their intention to enter the lists for the domination of the world. It would appear that he too saw spies in every walk of life. When served by the head waiter of the Burlington Hotel, he believed him to be a captain in the German army who he last met at Metz in France. M. O. 5 suffered, like the Germans, through lack of resources, making it initially difficult to prove Edmund's theories correct. He was helped along in 1908 with the publication of another work by William Le Cue, Spies of the Kaiser, published by the Weekly News. Initially, Le Cue received a steady trickle of letters from the concerned public with what they believed to be information on spies operating within Britain, this turned into a flood when the weekly news offered ten pounds for information on any foreign spies. These were all duly passed on to Edmunds. It's not hard to imagine the quality of some of the information received from a nation who now was in a naval arms race with Germany and had been programmed to believe spies were everywhere. One territorial captain, based in Essex, reported four Germans lived in a house, they had bicycles, photographic equipment, and were visited by women from London. Hardly damning evidence, but the volume of information received proved to Edmunds his theory. Spies were everywhere, and a dedicated counter-espionage organisation was needed. A government committee was formed to investigate Edmund's allegations. While at first sceptical of his assertions, Viscount Esher accused him of having espionage on the brain, the sheer weight of his evidence, provided by the public, seemed compelling. Its authenticity seemed not to be in question. The result was the establishment of the Secret Services Bureau in 1909. With spies being seen everywhere, the government came under pressure to clamp down on foreign nationals. Even before the outbreak of war, the Aliens Restriction Act and the Defence of the Realm Acts were making their way through Parliament in 1914. Both acts would be amended throughout the First World War and would eventually allow the government to control all aspects of an enemy alien's life, such as where they could travel and live. It affected nationals of belligerent and non-belligerent nations, imposing even tighter restrictions upon them. In 1913, Germany passed a law allowing for Germans to hold dual nationality. The result was that many German-born British citizens were now seen as a threat in the eyes of the British authorities dual citizenship created a possible contradiction of loyalties. The Home Office would routinely request proof that a naturalised British citizen of German origin had relinquished all rights to German citizenship. With the outbreak of war in 1914, the state organised the rounding up and internment of German nationals. Naturalised British citizens of German origin were asked to sign a declaration showing their commitment to Britain. The first wave of internment occurred in August and September 1914, but this only amounted to 10,000 Germans. It was not until the anti-German riots in May 1915 that it was decided that all Germans of military age should be interned. By November, the total had reached 29,000. Little had changed from a national security perspective. Germans in Britain were no more a threat in August 1914 than May 1915, but public opinion had hardened to the war news of 1915. For instance, after the bombardment of the North East Coast in 1914, police were given the power to remove German nationals or German-born British citizens who were exempt from internment from restricted areas if they felt the need. This included all ports and most of the east coast of England. Spy fever with the outset of war had turned into open Germanophobia. For Liberal MP Horatio Bottomley, the publisher of the popular John Bull magazine, patriotism and anti-German rhetoric were one and the same. He called for a vendetta against Germans in Britain and believed that naturalised Germans should be compelled to wear a distinctive badge.
For much of the 19th century, the British had been secure with their place in the world, and the Royal Navy enforced the Pax Britannica, which had guaranteed Britain's wealth. The Battle of Dorking was an expression of Britain's increasing insecurity. Both America and Germany were industrialising at a rapid rate and would soon overtake Britain. In Europe, with the defeat of France in the Franco-Prussian War, the balance of power shifted towards the newly formed Germany. Flexing her military might and industrial muscles, Germany's shipbuilding programme at the turn of the century was genuinely a threat to the British, though her secret services were not. The spy genre, which whipped the nation into a frenzy, served many masters. It sold newspaper copy and books, it strengthened the arguments for conscription and an increase in the size of the army. Hardline politicians used it to clamp down on foreign nationals. All the time public opinion was leading government policy, informed by the suspicion of a foreign power and its perceived intentions. It's interesting to note that after the First World War, Buchan's Richard Hannay would take part in two more adventures, both set in a post-war world which was beset with criminal gangs. Was Britain once more at peace with her role in the world? Thanks for listening all this season and all the previous seasons, and if you've missed any of those, you can buy one for just £2 each for a whole season in our store at the website thehistorynetwork.org. And we will be back later in the year with season 25. Thanks again for listening. You've been listening to the historynetwork.org podcast written by Angus Wallace, read by Nick Barker. <laughs>